Hello again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. In this video I'll be covering the arrival of my new Slant Pro and also some clips of production on a, of a little job in rapid turn doing some secondary machining operations. Alrighty, cheers. So I've been agonizing over should I sell one of my manual mills to make room for the Slant Pro? And oh, it's a hard thing to do. I need the big lathe because I need the capacity for some jobs. I can't sell the little lathe because that's the most used machine I've got. It's just so quick and handy. I need the big mill because I need the capacity for some jobs. So the only one left is the small mill. But that's just so handy and convenient. I don't really want to sell that if I can avoid it. So that really blocks out this part of the workshop it's absolutely chocker and I don't want to put a machine tool back up these steps again that was a nightmare getting it down um, this is a better area for putting cabinets and light machine and st stock and storage and things like that so so that blocks out this part of the workshop so what I've got left is my new extension and it's chocker so I have to make room in here somehow I can't extend out the workshop any further. So the, the plan is to shift the bench along to the wall and to shuffle all the machines down. The least used machines are the two grinders, the cylindrical grinder and the surface grinder. So they can be shuffled down, fairly cramped together. The, I've done the measurements and I should actually produce enough space here for the Slant Pro. So this will become the CNC shop with two 1100s and the Slant Pro. So I better get on now and start juggling it around. I have to remove that cabinet and put it in the back room and shift this bench and other cabinet around a bit, but that's all doable. So that's about 83 inches wide, guys. Do you think the Slant Pro will fit in there okay? It should do, looking at the dimensions. I need about 1.5 net plus some swinging doors and clearance. Um, for the uh, monitor stand and electrical cabinet and stuff, but it should just about work out, I think. Whew! Machine coming up this way. I'll make sure I'm not there. Right. Okay. You can escape the ramp away now. Yeah. Truck's gone. That was a bit scary. Trying to get the uh, crate up the sloping deck of the truck. We had to pull it up with a chain hoist and drag it up. It took about 20 minutes of hard yakka, and I was terrified that something would snap and the uh, whole caboodle would go hurtling down the hill through the front of the cab and into orbit. But of course it didn't happen. <laughs> it's still a bit nerve-wracking. Anyway, uh, just taking the lid off, have a wee peek inside, and uh, got a bit of a ramp here, some couple of bits of half-inch ply on some rails. We should be able to wheel it up all right with the pallet jack. When it came to lifting the lathe off the floor so I could remove the pallet plate underneath. I didn't want to buy the lifting kit because uh, it's just a one-off use and um, I've used chain hoists plenty of times in the past. They're very cheap, very safe and you can use them for all types of lifting and dragging tasks. So I just bolted a piece of steel there between two of the rafters and that will take um, at least a couple of tons. Um, so I'm not worried about the load on that with some 12 mil cap screws, where are we, through there with a washer, that, that'll take plenty of load, chain hoist, spread it out over uh, four points of contact with some doubled up nylon rope, um, you know that, that's really comfortable, um, you're only going a few inches off the ground but that, that, that setup would take a lot more than the uh, seven or eight hundred kilos that we've got here. 
Um, so I lifted it up off the deck enough to drag the uh, pallet out and now I'm just going to bolt the uh, adjustable feet underneath and drop it down on that. But I've also got the pallet jack here uh, there as a backup and some wooden blocks as a backup. I just don't like ever running risk because sometimes you can have a uh, a mental lapse especially if you're kind of flustered and working hard and and uh, just getting ahead of yourself a little bit you can have a mental lapse especially if you're working on your own and there's no one to check what you're doing um, and uh, you do something really silly um, it very seldom happens but you know that's when it's good to have a backup that's when it's good to have the blocks or the pallet jack underneath all the same, it's nice to have it resting down on its feet the way it's intended. You know, your head tells you it's safe, but there's a little bit of you that's nervous. And, and please don't think I'm saying that it's always safe to have rope strops and a, and a, a steel rod attached to your uh, ceiling framing. Um, it's safe in my situation, but it may not be in your situation. There's many variables here, and I'd hate there ever to be an accident from somebody copying my setup. Well, I'm going to have a bunch of fun setting up the new Slug Pro. I imagine some of you are looking at what I'm doing here and thinking, why does he keep buying Tormax? And, and that's a really good question. You know, I thought a lot about that. Um, before I bought the Slant Pro, I gave this subject a lot of thought and, and I looked at um, more industrial, better spec machines, more modern machines. And there's a factory, for example, in China, ZMAT, that make a whole range of machines. I think they're marketed through Automate CNC in the States. And um, they were very tempting bits of kit. But the problem for me is, in a small workshop, um, those are quite big machines and they have doors that open out the back of the machine so you can't put them close to the walls and you need quite a big shop to install that type of gear and uh, I don't have a big shop so if you sort of follow the the line of consequences from there um, it, it would mean for me to have a, a fully equipped shop uh, with all those type of more industrial machines I would need a much bigger premises and that would mean relocating somewhere else and bigger premises is higher overheads more expensive machines you really need to employ staff and I, I, I have been there in the past and done that in the past and I know I, I don't thrive as well in that situation in the past I was uh, started off as tool room manager and tool room designer uh, for uh, a, a fairly big concern here in New Zealand and um, then eventually I took over the factory as general manager and we had scores of machines and scores of staff and that experience while it was really good to have I found I actually didn't enjoy the work as much as hands-on and design uh, tool making um, machining and so on and so I and, and I like working alone or with just one other person. Um, I just like to be able to concentrate on what I'm doing and not get caught up in too much administration. And so that means a small shop. So you can see my reason there for staying with small machines and staying with Tormac. Uh, I'm also really interested in Tormac. I got to know Greg Jackson quite well. Not, I didn't actually personally meet him, but um, we emailed quite a lot. And it was a really sad day when he had that tragic accident. Um, if you go back into the early 2000s, Greg Jackson and I think it was Ed Korn um, originated the design and development of Tormax and I'm really interested in the history of Tormac. Um, if you have any knowledge of any other designers at that time uh, or, or more details of the history, please let me know or give me the links. I'm really interested. So, so Ed Korn and Greg Jackson um, developed the, the first 1100 CNC machine and designed it in their garage and got prototypes built in China and they weren't any good and then went back to China and got more prototypes built and eventually Tormac was born and uh, the different designs were developed and, it, and it's a fascinating story. Um, so that's also part of it, just, just the interesting uh, background of it. Another good thing about staying with Tormac is that you've got machines that are all of the same brand, of all the same basic controllers and uh, good, good uh, after-sales service and so on. And that's something I learned 
years ago when I was managing this factory that we had all different brands of machines and that wasted a lot of time trying to understand and learn about all these different operating systems. Anyway, getting back to Slant Pro and the installation of this new machine. Um, I want to be up front with you guys that are following me on this journey. Um, I am working directly for a while with Tormac on a couple of confidential matters and so I won't initially be doing many videos and I won't be able to answer any questions just so you're aware of that situation, that initial situation anyway. And there's my 8 station turret. It looks quite good quality at first glance anyway. Certainly a lot of work in that. Loads of plywood and pallets I'll have to cut up. Still they can add to my meagre firewood supplies to get us through the winter. And here we have one big cardboard box with the enclosure in it. Um, I'll fit the turret first and get that running um, before it gets too buried. But yeah, that's a pile of nicely painted sheet metal parts. And if anyone is looking to bring machinery into New Zealand, I would recommend door-to-door -door freight services uh, following a tip-off from a guy on the Zone Forum. Um, or was it a comment um, on my YouTube channel? Thanks for that. Uh, they were very fair priced. I think it was uh, 1900 New Zealand dollars. That's about 1200 US dollars. And the good thing about door to door freight services was that the estimated price they gave me turned out to be the actual price, unlike previous freight forwarders who gave a good estimated price but then ramped up the actual price after delivery. Rapid Turn's got really great uses as a secondary operations, low cost little lathe as well. Here I'm just going to spot, chamfer and uh, drill the back of a bunch of these parts. So I'll just show you how easy it is to use. Am I in the way of the camera? Just engage the lock, release the 5C collet, pop the part in, tighten it up, disengage the lock and off we go. You couldn't get much simpler than this secondary operation. Just spotting and chamfering a drill hole in the back of this part. So we've just got a spot drill and a chamfering drill. And this can be conversationally programmed in a few minutes. Thanks for following my ramblings, guys. Um, while I might not be doing many videos on, on Slant Pro for a while, I will continue to do other videos. So uh, see you soon. Cheers.